Welcome to this presentation on Vincent van Gogh. And uh, as I was saying at the beginning of our conversation, van Gogh holds a very special place in my, in my life. Uh, paintings like these, like the Starry Nights, Van Gogh's mother used to tell him that every star above was like a promise of God. So a starry night like this was a, a night of hope. And uh, my mother just adored Van Gogh. Uh, we read all his letters, the letters that Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. If, if, if you have the opportunity, if, if there's one book you, you should read, read this one. It's just, and you can read a letter or two a day. It doesn't matter what profession you'll do or want to do. It is just something that is really extraordinary. And so I grew up hearing about Van Gogh and his enormous efforts to, to paint and, uh, and the troubles that he faced because he was so honest. You know, again and again, you find that Van Gogh's problems come from his honesty. And he's an art dealer and he tells people what he thinks. That annoys his bosses because, you know, uh, that was not what they wanted to do. What they wanted is to make as much money as they could. Uh, but when he goes to the, the Borinash, and we will talk about this, the Borinash was this horrible place where they had all the miners, just one of the worst mines, and he, he's a missionary. And so he really does what he's supposed to do. He really shares everything he's got with the miners. He puts himself out there. He's so, so beautiful. But you know what happens? that the other uh, missionaries get jealous and fire him because he made them look bad. And his life is, is full of this you know, all the time. You know, his pursuit of, of being an honest man, an honest artist, to do what is right, to not go into this artificial posing and nonsense. He's so truthful, he's, he's so honest, so wonderful. And so I can tell you right away that it has always bothered me, these people that treat Van Gogh as a mad artist or that try to explain his genius because of mental instability. It's nonsense. I mean, no true artist is really normal. That is impossible. I mean, it requires a certain vocation to dedicate your life completely to something that maybe, but maybe it will never make funds, but to do it anyway whether it is painting or singing or writing, right? So to do that, you require a certain, certain madness because it breaks the logic, right? In, in, in the world today, we are supposed to do things that are logical, right? We're supposed to pursue a successful career, you know, all this, to, to work, and, and, and to not expect money is almost like a sin, especially here in the U.S. Terrible. Right? So that is the case. Now, let's face it. When I spoke with all those artists in Florence, what I told them is the reality is that very few people are like Michelangelo. 
or Picasso or Da Vinci. And, and I'm not talking about talent, I'm talking about success. There are some individuals like these that become massively successful, become recognized. Michelangelo by the popes. Da Vinci kind of moves around and gets different patrons. Picasso, as we will see next week, by his cunning. But most of the time, artists are like Van Gogh. Most of the time, no matter how hard you try, the money never comes. The success defined in material terms never happens. Most of the time, you know, you live by any means necessary, sometimes, you know, with the help of a family member or your spouse, or, you know, sometimes you have to do other works to more or less make by, go by in life. Now, that does not, I would even say that a true artist, how can you find out if somebody is a true artist? I'm not saying a good artist, just a true artist. How can you find it out? Well, it's easy. Artists don't work for money, period. They, they do for them, for he or she, they just cannot live if they don't do their art. If they get paid a lot, a little, it, it's a secondary concern. The most important thing is to be able to do that that you think is your art. That's how you can tell, right? So in that sense, Van Gogh is an absolute artist. And now, because this way of looking at the world defies this kind of capitalistic view of people, right? Then it can only be explained either the person is crazy or you know, he's pathologically unhappy, right? He's miserable. It's not true. I can tell you that somebody like Van Gogh, even if he was never successful financially, but somebody that is able to do these starry nights that he painted, or those fields full of sun, and to be able to understand that, nothing is more fulfilling than that. You cannot aspire to a happier feeling than, than that. That is a success that is worth more than money, that is worth more than fame, that it, it's, it's a, an intimate accomplishment. So uh, I believe that, that Van Gogh was an honest human being a great artist and a man who did and said in an absolute harmony. He was absolutely congruent in his ideas and his actions. Sometimes we, we can think of madness as this kind of abrupt change Right? Somebody that suddenly becomes another person. And yet in Van Gogh, what we find is this remarkable consistency. From when he starts to deal in art, to when he's a missionary, to when he takes care of a pregnant prostitute and helps her have the baby and protects her or when he takes care of the peasants that he paints and lives like them, all throughout his life, a life of honesty, of congruity. And yes, I would say that in spite of all his troubles, a fulfillment and of happiness. So uh, that is for me, Vincent Van Gogh. And uh, I encourage you to, to read his letters. I encourage you to see his work. Uh, I encourage you to, to go to these new immersive experiences that they're doing. 
where you know they have all these projections of his paintings. But more importantly, understand Van Gogh. That is the crucial thing. That is what can change your life. That is what can make you a better person. Read his letters. Become familiar with his way of thinking. I cannot think of, of, a, of a better message to share with you than that. Now, the first thing that we need to understand when we're talking of Van Gogh is that he's Dutch. He uh, comes from the Netherlands or Holland. And this is a country that has been called an impossible country. And why do they say that? Well, you know why? Because it's under the level of the ocean. So it's always in danger of disappearing. Now with global warming, I have no idea what could happen to the Netherlands. Uh, but th they're always fighting the ocean. They're always putting these barriers because like just in 1530, 20 towns just disappeared, just like that. See, the, the water is above the land. So you have to always be creating these barriers to prevent the ocean from flooding everything. And uh, now, probably because of this, uh, the earth, you know, the, 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 the contact with the water has made the flowers in Holland some of the most beautiful in the world. The earth is, is very fertile and, and, and you have these brilliant colors. Here you have some of them, natural colors in Poland. Now, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, the Spanish tried to conquer Poland. And uh, the Inquisition condemned three million Dutch to death because they're Protestants. So the Catholic Church condemned them as heretic, imagine. But neither the ocean nor the Inquisition nor all of those countries that have tried to conquer the Netherlands have succeeded. And Part of that is because the Dutch are very close to each other. It has been said that in Holland, whatever is not a duty is a sin. So you have the duty to keep the seawalls. You don't keep the part of the seawall that you are responsible for. Maybe the whole neighborhood disappears, right? So interestingly, in, in, in the Netherlands is the country that has less statues to individual heroes in all of Europe, perhaps because the hero is really the collectivity, the people that fight together, that blend together. Now, uh, the father of Van Gogh was a minister. And he was born the 30th of March of 1853. And here you see his father, uh, Theodorus Van Gogh, a minister of the Reformed Church. So he was a, a very strict man, you know, in the way that he led his congregation. Now, the the mom of, of, this is a little church of his father. And the mother, Ana Cornelia Carventus, had uh, 
a long history of mental health in her family. Vanko has five brothers, Anna, Theo, Elizabeth, Will, and Cornelius. And uh, the family used to read a lot of books together. And Van Gogh loved the books. He also liked, as a young kid, 10, 11, 12, he liked to walk in the storms. And it was raining. He used to go out there and, and he loved to get totally wet in the rain. And he also liked to walk in storms at night. And then he loved to uh, collect wildflowers, uh, eggs, nests, beetles, all these little things, nature, that he just adored. Now, all this love of nature was in contrast with the way that he hated school. He detested school. And uh, they tried everything. He just would run away from school. He did not follow the classes. Uh, eventually, they sent him to a boarding school in Sevenberger. And when his father visited him, he just flung his arms around his father's neck and begged him to take him back home. But the father, instead of you know, bringing him home, he put him into another boarding school that was even stricter than the one before. This photograph uh, that was taken in March of 1868, where you see a young Van Gogh with his arms like crossed like that kind of shows you this, his rejection of school, his hatred of school. And, uh, you know, it was weeks before he was about to graduate, but it got to a point where he just could not take school anymore. So before he graduated, he knew that the train that was in the school took him directly home. So what he did, he obviously as a student, he had no money, but he just walked following the tracks of the train until he got back home. And so, you know, the next 16 months were just wonderful for him. Because, you know, the, he could do whatever he wanted. So he goes back to collecting nests and, and all this. But in Poland, as I said before, you know, the duty is very important. So the father says, okay, if you are not going to be studying, then you're going to be working. And one of his uncles... Uh, his uncle Vincent, the same name as he, was an art dealer. He had a, a gallery called Goupil. And so Van Gogh was like early, like late teens, 16, 17. And so he joins Goupil. And like everything else that he does in his life. He just goes completely into studying art. So he learns all about art and the people and all this. But then, you know, when he's in the, in the gallery, he tells people his honest opinion. And so if he sees an artist that he doesn't believe is very good, he tells the customers, you know, I don't think this guy is very good or I think the price is too high or in other words, he says exactly what he thinks, which is terrible for business 
Because in a gallery, what you want to do is to pay the artist the least possible and make the customers pay the most, right? So here you have this guy that is the nephew of the owner and is giving all this talk, straight talk to the, to the customers, which was just absolutely unacceptable. And so the, the uncle, Vincent, sends him to London. And so in London, you know, the, 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 there was less, you know, there was a wholesale operation. They didn't deal with individual customers. So they thought, well, maybe Van Gogh there will be okay. And uh, in London, what, what Vincent finds, and this, these are the kind of galleries that he used to work in. But in London, he discovers misery. England is one of the first industrial societies of the world. So the industrial revolution has changed everything. So now you have people that are working and, and there is this unbelievable inequality. The rich have just enormous amounts and the poor people have nothing. Now, if you look at some of the way that the poor people dressed Sometimes they have like top hats and all this. That is because the poor were allowed to go to the garbage cans of the rich. And sometimes they picked up the clothes that they discarded. That is why uh, Charlie Chaplin dresses like, you know, like, like he does. So he comes across all of this poverty. And at the same time, he discovers religion. He starts uh, studying uh, the Bible and uh, he, he's fired from the gallery. And so he finds work. Uh, he tries to really follow religion and really do what Jesus would have done. He studies uh, books like this one, Imitation of Jesus Christ. And so he gets a job as a teacher in a place called Ramsgate. And it's a, a school where he has, he's in charge of 24 boys that are most of them without or, orphans. And he works from, with these kids from six in the morning to eight at night. And he's supposed to teach them French, German, math, recitation, dictation, uh, prayer, etc. So Van Gogh throws himself into this, uh, into this job. And uh, he becomes a, a preacher. And then he tells his father, and he tells him that he wants to become a pastor. And so then the father says, okay, if you want to become a pastor, then you have to go to theology school and study eight years of theology. So Van Gogh tries, you know, he tries to study and he tries to, but at some point, he tells his teacher, is this really necessary? I mean, why do I have to study eight years to do something I can do right now? And so he gets out of that program and he travels to the Borinash. The Borinash is this uh, place that has these coal mines. And it's really like hell on earth. The miners, uh, 
live in the, in the worst conditions. Sometimes they have to spend 12 and 14 hours under the earth. Their skin becomes black with the cold. Their lungs, uh, uh, a man at 35 was already an old man, dying of, of the shortness of, of breath. And so uh, in this environment, Van Gogh really tries to do what Jesus would have done. He, he's, he accompanies the, the miners, he goes to them, he lives with them, he goes underground with them. Uh, at some point there is this terrible accident and uh, they don't have anything to take care of them. So Van Gogh sells his possessions he sells his clothes and shoes, and he buys band uh, things to bandage them, help help them in in this horrible uh, situation. He takes care of the children. He uh, preaches. He he just gives himself totally and completely to the cause and to help these people that are in despair. So the Bori Nash is, is, is one of the most dramatic uh, chapters in, in Van Gogh's life. And the saddest part is that uh, the other missionaries get angry at him. And they accuse him, get this, they accuse him of having a regrettable excess of missionary seal. And with that accusation, they fire him. The reality is that Van Gogh was really doing the job. He was not faking it. He was really, if he was saying he was a missionary, he really was a missionary like any of you would be, I'm sure. But that was not what his bosses wanted to, to hear. The same way that in the gallery, that they didn't want him to tell the truth. They wanted him to lie in here. You know, they were all comfortable. They had their little house apart from the mine. They all, you know, gave mass and so on. They didn't want to have to actually live with the miners and, and eat with them and share, no. So, you know, Van Gogh goes back to his home and tells his father, and his father tries to in, put him into a mental institution. So he leaves and he comes back and he, he hears about this, uh, he hears a sermon in which he says, he, he reads that, that everything that is good and beautiful comes from God. And that making art is also a way of serving God. And so with, with that idea, Van Gogh comes back to the Borinash as an artist. And he comes back with a portfolio of art, if not of sermons. So he comes back to his, to his house as an artist now. And he has a, a cousin that is called Kivos Stryker. Kivos is 35 years old. She has a son and she is a widow. So in those days, a woman like that would be absolutely impossible for her to marry again. Nobody would, would marry a woman like her. So Van Gogh tries to uh, offer, to, to, to love her, to tell her that he's, he would take care of her. But Kivos's father, uh, is against this 
because he's an artist. And to be an artist is almost like to be a pariah. At some point, Van Gogh says, let me talk to her. And I will put my hand over a candle. So I will talk to her as much as I can resist my hand over the candle burning. Well, not even then. And she tells her, Kivos tells him, nay, no, never. And then what is worse is that Van Gogh's own father condemns him. And he tells him, God damn you. Move away. Get out of my house. As Van Gogh left, he heard a door lock behind him. So he is rejected in love and he is rejected by his father and his family. He travels to The Hague In The Hague, he has a, a cousin, Anton Mauvais. And Anton is an artist that is successful. And he gives him some ideas. But in those days, uh, what successful painters did was that they painted uh, figures that were not real. So Van Gogh loves to paint real people peasants. And, and so one day, Mauve comes to his, to his studio, and he sees that Van Gogh is painting real workers and real peasants. And he mocks him. And uh, Van Gogh would tell him, if you had spent rainy nights in the streets of London, or cold nights in the Borinash, you would also have ugly lines in your face. And perhaps a husky voice too. So he breaks with the cousin and he starts painting all these peasants that he makes friends with. And he has the, what little money he has, he shares it. And he would create his first masterpiece, which is this work that is called The Potato Eaters. So it's a, 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 a work where he puts these, this family and the, the tones are brown, but there is a beautiful use of color in the faces. And you see the expression in the eyes and in the hands as they eat, as they serve the coffee, as they eat the potatoes in that dim light of the, the home, the po home of poverty. So he makes like a family of models. The poorest people know that in his studio, they, they will find something to eat. And so all these people come and they pose for him and he does these drawings of these people. He, he, he puts a, a kitchen. And among his models, his favorite is uh, a deaf and dumb man called Adrianus Jacob Cinderland that he would call the orphan man. So it is one of those poor people in the times that dress with a high hat and some of the discarded clothes of the wealthy. And he would paint him in all his sorrow. This image uh, is so dramatic. You see this old man that is weeping and that has all the weight in his back, the weight of poverty, of misery. And among the people that, that come to the studio is a prostitute called Sien Hurnik. And, uh, and Sien is pregnant. 
So she has a little girl and she's pregnant. And so what, what Van Gogh does is that he fixes his studio and he puts a little cradle for the baby. Of course, this is a, a, a scandal that he would take in a pregnant prostitute, pregnant by another man. But Van Gogh says, well, what is more manly? To protect a pregnant woman or to reject her? And so Van Gogh has fixed his little studio for the baby, has painted the walls. But the brother, Theo, comes to see Van Gogh. And he tells him that if he doesn't break with Sien, he is going to stop sending him money. And he's not going to be able to continue being an artist. And so it is a terrible blow for, for Van Gogh because he knows what's going to happen. So he tells uh, Sien that he will not be able to help her anymore. Uh, he would say that the Sien goes with the little baby that was named after Van Gogh. And, this, and they see him go. And he knows what's going to happen. Eventually, Sien would go back to prostitution. Then she would give away her children. And she would end up killing herself, like Van Gogh. And uh, Van Gogh goes to a place called Drenthe. And uh, he, he walks for six hours through a storm of frozen rain and snow. But he would say that he cried most of the way, that he sowed the path with his tears. Eventually, he would return to confront his father in Noonan. And uh, he would tell him that he was wrong in damning him and, 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 and expulsing him from the home. And he also would uh, confront his brother. And he would tell him, this money that you give me is not charity. You're buying my work. So you're not doing me a favor. You're helping me, but you're not doing me a favor. Now, I must say for all those people that, you know, look at Van Gogh, oh, he took the money of his brother and this other. Frankly, whatever money the brother invested in him, there is no better investment in the history of the world. If you were to compare the amount of money that the brother sent every month to, to Van Gogh, and what his paintings were worth and what they brought to Theo's family later, it would be what? A million to one? Two million to one? Enormous amount. So Van Gogh settles these, these, and then he starts to paint the weavers. The weavers are the most political and the most uh, militant of the workers who, you know, are confronting the, the social conditions of injustice. So in this crucial moment in his life, Van Gogh confronts the father, confronts the brother, expresses a political opinion. And then his, his mother breaks her hip. And Van Gogh takes care of her lovingly. He just completely helps her like no other person in the family. And he even paints her. He changes his way of painting to make her happier. He does this beautiful painting of the church for the mother. 
and paints flowers for her. And there is a, this woman called Margot Begman that uh, falls in love with Van Gogh because she's moved by how he takes care of the mother and how he's so generous. But the family of her, she's wealthy, and the family condemned Van Gogh because he's an artist. And they rather uh, put Margot in a confined place rather than allow him to love Vincent. Imagine the protests of Van Gogh are among the first feminist documents. Why would a father have the right to practically incarcerate his daughter? Uh, the father has a heart attack and the family blames Van Gogh. They say that it was because of the disagreements that he had with him that he was ill and he dies. So now he's also very separated from his family. But his artistic work continues. Look at these beautiful works. Observe over the little water, the water, the little dove that is flying, just an exquisite touch that he does. He travels to uh, Antwerp and he tries to, uh, to join the Academy of Art and they're painting women. And so Van Gogh paints this woman, but they tell him, well, that is not the woman we like. I mean, we paint beautiful women. Why do you paint a woman like that? And says, well, Van Gogh said, because a real woman needs hips and needs to have uh, a belly and needs to, a woman that carries a child. This is a real woman, not those thin models that you have there and those plaster figures. But again, they expel Vincent. And so then he tries to, uh, to paint uh, prostitutes. And he does a couple of paintings, not too, not too many. Uh, all through his letters, Van Gogh describes how difficult it is for him to become an artist. There are some artists that have natural facility. People like Leonardo da Vinci or Caravaggio, you know, they have this kind of ease. But for Van Gogh, it was very difficult. So he, he does all these little contractions where he puts these uh, lines that, he, and then later he copies the little squares to try to figure the, the perspective. So he does these kind of like grids and then he places the grids and then he, he looks at every little square and he tries to copy the, what is in the little square to try to understand more or less how nature is constructed. And he, he does uh, many works of a great variety of, of, of places. Eventually, he agrees to live with his brother in Paris. And so Paris is a city that is full of galleries and artists. And so for Van Gogh, it is perhaps the best of times. He is with, with his brother. He meets all the leading figures of the Impressionist movement. And uh, he has a, a difficult time uh, finding models because models are very expensive in Paris. But he paints the cafes and since he cannot afford models, he does paintings of interesting things. For example, his shoes. These are Van Gogh's shoes and as he used to walk so much, you can see, you know, how worn out they are. He also paints flowers and 
you know, the flowers, he would say, are less expensive than the models and have the advantage of not moving. So he did these beautiful vases of, of flowers. Inspired, of course, in the sunflowers that he would become his main, main flower. Uh, Van Gogh would be identified by painting sunflowers. But what he does the most is self-portraits. Again, because you know he doesn't have uh, other people to paint, he paints himself. And he would complete a remarkable series of self-portraits. He would also be very interested in the art of Japan. And he would try to emulate the art of Japan. He would see some prints of Japan that he would try to recreate. But he was interested not only in the art of Japan, but also in the philosophy and the fact that artists lived in commu com communes and helped each other. Here you have a, a, a painting that he does of his dealer. And in the background, you see all the different influences of the type of art that he's working with. Now, his brother Theo would marry Joan Bunger, this young uh, girl. And Van Gogh realizes that now it's probably difficult that he should leave so that his brother could live with his wife. So after this wonderful time together, he would travel to Arles in 1888. So Arles has a much warmer weather than Paris. And the spring in Arles is absolutely extraordinary. You see the, the blossoms of the fruit trees and, and suddenly the entire tree becomes a flower. Few things in art are as beautiful as this spring in our list that Van Gogh is able to paint and to capture. He would also do the, the hay and the people in our list, his models, uh, a suave, and the knights. Uh, Van Gogh believed that the knight has more colors than the day. And when you look at a work like this with so many nuances in the sky, and you see green and, and yellow and the reflection of light in the water. And then he paints himself as a, a, a Japanese artist, as a Japanese monk. And he begins to... Uh, to think of creating a commune, uh, a place where artists can live together and can help each other. And so he reaches out to, to several artists and asks them if they can send art, if they would be interested. And it is in this uh, context that he would meet uh, Gauguin. Gauguin has uh, an interesting story. He had been a banker. His life, he tells so many myths that it's not very difficult to separate myth from reality. He says he was Peruvian. He says that he was an aristocrat. Though, you know, he traces his ancestry uh, in, in impossible ways. He says he's an uh, 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 inheritor of European aristocracy, but he also has Inca and Aztec blood, imagine. So this is a man that was a banker, was a businessman, and was an, an amateur artist. He was a friend of the Impressionists. He went with them in the weekends, once in a while. He had, took his little classes. 
But then uh, when the stock exchange crashed in Paris, he uh, has a financial setback and he decides to, to move to become an artist himself. So he's very clever with words. He's very s smart. And, you know, he, he gets Theo to pay his debts in exchange of going to Van Gogh's Yellow House. The Yellow House is an effort that Van Gogh does to create this commune of artists. He had put in it all of his savings, all of his inheritance, everything he had. And he had painted the entire house in yellow that for him was the color of art. So the first thing that Gauguin does when he arrives to the yellow house is he, said, he complains, says, why is this shit color everywhere, he would say. And Van Gogh had put in every little room a painting of his decorated with sunflowers. But Gauguin was this kind of arrogant, uh, petulant man. And he begins to criticize everything that Van Gogh does, not just the color of the yellow house, but also, you know, he, he, had, he had gone to exotic lands and paid to different natives in Tahiti and other places. But when Van Gogh takes him and he shows him the fields that he loves, and he shows him this little cafe that he went, and how he had all these models that he used to paint, and the little billiards table, and how he had gained permission to paint there. And, and Gauguin says, but why do you paint with models? Why did you do it a tête, to, by head? I don't need models. I could, and so all these people that Van Gogh had painted personally, Gauguin copies him and re takes all his work and does it, but just by memory. So Van Gogh at first thinks that, that this man is sincere, but then he suddenly realizes that he's not. And he paints like, this is the chair of Gauguin and this is the chair of Van Gogh painted by Vincent. He goes back to painting, you know, the, the postman the fields that he does. And uh, Gauguin uh, satirizes Van Gogh. This is a painting that uh, Van Gogh does. Uh, I mean, Gauguin does of Van Gogh. And you see that he's painting these sunflowers that are already rotting. And he puts Van Gogh with the face like of a monkey, you know, like a criticism of Van Gogh. And Eventually, Gauguin decides to leave. And so for Van Gogh, this is a terrible blow because Gauguin was more famous than he was. And so if Gauguin left, all this dream of creating a commune of artists where others would come and where artists would help each other and would live together, a dream that we still have that one day artists can help and can live in harmony with the other artists. And so this produces uh, an incident that has been very controversial because when Gauguin leaves, Van Gogh cuts his ear, part of his ear, and sends it to Gauguin. He gives the ear in an envelope to a prostitute that was in contact with Gauguin. And so many people look at this incident and use it as an example 
to prove that Van Gogh was crazy. But they do not understand the meaning of Van Gogh's act. We must remember that Van Gogh was a deeply religious man. And the cutting of the ear is a sacred wound. It is the only violent act committed by the apostles. In Gethsemane, when the Roman soldiers were apprehending Jesus, St. Peter cuts the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. And the last miracle that Jesus does is restoring the ear of the Roman soldier, as you can see in this picture. So this incident of cutting the ear as a way of expressing absolute disappointment is an extreme gesture, but it is a recognizable gesture that is expressed not only in the Bible, but also in works of Sola and others. Unfortunately, when the news gets out that Van Gogh has cut his ear and send it to Gauguin that had betrayed him. They publish it in the local newspaper. They lock Van Gogh up in a mental hospital. And while Van Gogh is confined to this place, the yellow house is flooding. He's finally able to gain permission to, to save some of the works. And the works that were in the Yellow House are now the gems of most of the European museums in the world. So he, from, he travels to another mental institution in Saint-Rémy. And in Saint-Rémy, he is able to work in, in better conditions. He, he would do many of, the, of these works through his window. He could see these, uh, these flowers. He could paint the, the patients of the hospital. And then he would try to put color to the drawings of other classic draftsmen like Millet. So he would take these motives and he would do them in color. We see the inspiration and then Van Gogh's work. And sometimes even his own work that he had done in drawing he would now express in, uh, in painting. And his little nephew, Vincent, was born to Theo and his wife. And he would send them this lovely work. For a brief time, Van Gogh would actually, he would sell one work. This work would be the only one that he would sell in his entire uh, life. The Red Vineyard. And then Albert Urier would write a great review of him. But uh, Van Gogh now leaves to Ouvres, where he is uh, taken care of by Dr. Gachet. In this last period of his life would be perhaps the most productive. 
he would do uh, 70 paintings, some of them enormous, as you can see in these images. Now, there is controversy about his death. The accepted theory is that when Van Gogh realizes that his little nephew, Vincent, has been born, he understands that now it will be very difficult for Theo to send him money. And so not wanting to be a burden, he would commit suicide. That is what has always been understood as the reason for his death. However, in the most recent biography of uh, Stephen Naife and Gregory White Smith, they came up with a different theory. What they say is that guns were not a part of the French culture and that Van Gogh never had a gun. And what the authors say is that in those days in France, there was an American show based on Buffalo Bill. And that this show had been in the, in, in the place where Van Gogh was, was killed. And that these two, uh, two brothers, the brothers uh, Sixton, had bought a pistol. And so according to these authors, it is possible that these brothers that always bullied Van Gogh when he was painting could have shot him. And what they say is that Van Gogh's wound was in the heart. So normally people that commit suicide with a gun shoot themselves in the head. Now they say if, let's suppose that Van Gogh had shot himself in the heart. Well, if you put a bullet and you're holding the gun at that close range, the bullet would come out of your body. And yet the bullet was still in Vincent's body. So they assumed that maybe it was shot from three or four feet of distance. However, Vincent uh, never accused anybody. We do know that the brothers, René and Gaston fled and never came back. And that the gun that was used in the death of Engo never appeared. Uh, half past midnight on uh, July 29 of 1890, Theo had come to console Vincent. He was still alive a couple of days. And they talked and he cradled him. And finally, he died in his arms. Now, the church that Van Gogh had painted so lovingly refused to do the service in the church or to bury him in uh, the cemetery. So in the hotel, Theo organized the funeral. Uh, he put the, the paintings that Vincent had done and some people came uh, from France, from Paris and some artists. Uh, they draped in flowers and candles, like Holland style. And, uh, and he found a place to bury him. There was a little patch of land. And he said, he said, it's not much more than a bit of bare earth in a barren field, but it is a sunny spot 
among the wheat fields. Now, the, the whole Van Gogh family went down in this kind of of explosion of, of tragedy. Theo did everything he could and, and, and everybody started referring to Van Gogh as this mad artist and this artist that was crazy and so on. And so what he thought is that the best way to, to counter the madness was by publishing Van Gogh's letters. And he dedicated his life to, to prove that, that uh, Van Gogh was a, a great artist. But he dies of sorrow about a year later. And then, you know, the, the rest of, of the Van Goghs uh, go into this despair. You know, the, uh, the other brother, Cor, uh, shoots himself. Uh, Vincent's favorite sister, Ville, is committed to an insane asylum. And she was confined there for 40 years, force-fed every day. In 1904, Sien, the prostitute that Van Gogh had helped, commits also uh, suicide. The only one that continues to fight is Theo's widow, uh, Joe Bunger. She makes sure that Vincent's letters are published. She keeps knocking on the doors of the galleries and the museums so that they show Vincent's work. And suddenly, Van Gogh's work becomes the most popular in the world. He achieves millions and millions of dollars. This, this artist that hardly ever sold a thing is now the most popular artist in the world. In 1914, 20 years after his death, Joe had Theo's body brought from Ultrich and she buried him next to Vincent overlooking the wheat fields above Oofs. She placed uh, matching stones side by side with matching inscriptions. One said, Isi repose Vincent van Gogh. And another one, Isi repose Theodoru 